hopefully nothing will go wrong. But then we have been told that I think Guyana has the most dangerous snake, the most dangerous spider. Centipedes, scorpions, alligators, spiders. Um, we've got disease. Disease could be a big one. Um, dehydration, heat stroke. Exploding trees, grenades that fall from them. Uh, that's a true story. Um, you name it, it can kill you. Uh, whereas in the UK, all you've got to do is just a, a badger. That's as bad as it gets. Uh, we're probably going to die. If I'm honest, it's not as dangerous as I thought it's going to be, I think. Serranal Fines is typically described as the world's greatest living explorer. But after a lifetime of breaking new ground, he now says that the golden age of exploration is over. Discovering the hearts of jungles, crossing deserts and scaling mountains is, he says, no longer enough. Today's explorers will be remembered for discovering new facts about the places and people that were first brought to light by the geographic explorers who went before. Beginnings of any kind are inevitably daunting. You may devise on paper from the comfort of your living room plans A to Z, but how well any of these strategies will survive those first moments on the ground will never be known until you are there staring them square in the eye. In the depths of the night we began our journey into the interior. A 13 hour bus journey, the thought of which made even the locals cringe, was a true baptism of fire. As night turned to day, the true nature of the roads became evident. A dirt track going on for hundreds of miles in both directions through spectacular jungle. At Karupakari, we blearily boarded the aging pontoon and crossed the mighty Essequibo River. The purpose of our trip was simple, to assess the health of the indigenous Guyanese population and to determine if they are at increased risk of western lifestyle conditions such as high blood pressure and diabetes. Although only 8 o'clock in the morning, the heat was already building. By the time we entered the savannah, it was almost unbearable, so the discovery of a flat tyre had us hoping for a quick turnaround. But in classic Guyanese fashion, the spare tyre also proved to be flat, leaving us baking for a little while longer. So there we were, four medical students from the University of Aberdeen, with just two years of medical training, armed with nothing more than basic measuring equipment and a whole lot of irrepressible enthusiasm. This last asset remained almost surprisingly uncrushed, after the many obstacles we had encountered to get here. Ethical approvals, university strikes, government changes, unanswered emails, and an endless bus journey. Finally, we had arrived. Okay, so here we are at the Cayman House Research Centre, down in Upacari. We got here after someone precarious 13 hour bus from and my back is still killing me. As our first day in Guyana drew to a close, our weary bodies called for nothing more than a comfortable long night's sleep. We set up our hammocks, clambered in and drifted off, our thoughts rarely straying from the days to come. The sun rose on day two and we set about finding the health worker. He was in fact on holiday and had quite literally gone fishing. We had been in Guyana less than a day and we were facing the prospect of going immediately behind schedule. Eventually perseverance prevailed and we set up our base in the village health hut and anxiously welcomed our first participant. So we start off by doing the questionnaire, and then after we do the questionnaire, I'll take your blood pressure, and I'll measure how strong your lungs are, and I'll measure your height and your weight. With experience and hindsight, we can now look back on those early days, all of us getting a little more excited by each and every new person in the clinic, with a touch of fondness, not least at our naivety. Each night, we bask in the amiable warmth of the setting sun, with one spectacle soon being replaced by another, as the Milky Way emerged to light our night skies. Waking us each morning at 5am was the sun creeping into our hammocks, telling us that we had already slept in too long, as the majority of the men in the village had already headed off to their farms to beat the midday heat. With each new day, our routine became more established. Wake up, 
collect data all morning and collapse in the afternoon when it was too hot to do anything else. We would watch in admiration in the shade as children seemingly immune to the 40 degree heat played cricket and ran endlessly around the village pitch. During this time we got to know people, made friends and even gained a pet along the way. Otter, the village tapir. It was surreal seeing an animal we could only ever associate with a zoo being treated like any beloved dog or cat back home. He followed us around, licked the salt from our legs and kept us entertained during the quieter spells at the help hut. Even when his owner returned for him, he refused to leave our side. One morning, we found time to venture down to the Rupununi River, the lifeblood of the village. It was here that locals fished with bow and arrow, travelled to neighbouring villages, and where children played despite the caiman and piranhas. On two occasions, we travelled to outlying satellite villages, where we were inundated with people wanting to participate. These days were packed, collecting data, followed by bouncy journeys back to Yubikari. Despite the cloud of red dust that covered everything, including us, in a thick layer of dirt, the boys opted to ride in the back of the pickup truck, ignoring the perfectly good seats inside the car. As our time in Yupikari came to an end, we packed up our belongings and prepared for the fresh challenges of a new village. Back on the road again, this time in a car with seat belts and air conditioning, the unspeakable luxury of which cannot be overstated. Through the wide open savannah so recognisable from the bus journey two weeks before, we came to another pontoon, somewhat more precarious than the last, to be met on the other side by a reception committee led by the village leader and his council members. With no electricity and little running water, Katoka was a significantly more remote village. On arrival, our setup was smoother, more professional, and to any onlookers, it may even have seemed like we knew what we were doing. Evidence of our newfound remoteness immediately became apparent as each night we came across a vast array of creepy crawlies amongst our belongings. In order for us to quite literally avoid being caught with our trousers down, our pre-toilet checks became more vigilant, especially after a snake appearance forced us to question our true need for the most basic of human functions. With our experience from Yupikari behind us, we became a well-oiled machine. Some of us manned the health hut, while the other two braved the searing midday heat to go house to house in the hope of finding more people to participate. At night, the dogs, so docile throughout the day, fought, barked and yowled, which, combined with a stifling, airless hut, ensured that sleep was kept to a bare minimum. Last night was rough. Last night was rough. I mean, it was our first night in the hammocks that was just so bad. Our only supply of water came from the communal taps or pumps scattered around the village. For some of us, this simple task of refilling water bottles proved too difficult. Before school started, we were invited to join in on a local playground game, not dissimilar to marbles. Despite our best efforts, the children set about mercilessly destroying us with ease. So I think Don's very good at this game. After a particularly productive afternoon of house-to-house -house visits, we were invited to join the village cricket practice. With stumps made from sticks and with a pitch nothing more than empty scrubland, we were reminded of our remoteness and how far away we were from those cold, wintry days back home. We played as the sun set over the trees, people of all ages from across the village turning up to take part, or even just to watch. Unfortunately, we did not put in much of a show, with all bar one of us reaffirming Scotland's poor cricketing reputation. With our pile of data mounting and concerns over insufficient people petering away, our time in Katoga came to a close. We travelled down to the river to begin the next leg of our journey to Rewa village. Rewa was the smallest of the communities we visited. Located in the middle of dense jungle, positioned at the confluence of the Rupununi and Rewa rivers, only accessible by a three-hour boat journey. The recent drought had lowered the river, making the journey longer, but this was not to be complained about, as it proved to be one of the most spectacular journeys of our trip. The 
river snaked through miles of jungle, the birds chirping as they swept like fighter jets low over the water in search of food. We passed menacing black caiman, our boat captain opting to take us uncomfortably close so barely a meter of murky water separated us. <laughs> Giant river otters occasionally popped their heads above the surface of the water to judge whether we were friend or foe before diving down again only to appear five minutes later, their curiosity having led them to follow us. A seemingly innocuous sandbank turned out to be a passing village's football pitch. The prospect of retrieving your ball from the mouth of a caiman somewhat detracting from the idyllic setting. Dugout canoes and boats laden with goods infrequently passed by, those on board radiating the typical Amerindian friendliness we had become so familiar with. As we arrived into Rewa, the red dust of the savannah seemed far removed from this new world we had entered. We disembarked onto the steep, muddy banks and hauled our bags up to the research hut, where we were met by the village leader. Much to our surprise, having heard about our research from the other villagers, he had decided to accommodate us in the famed Eco Lodge, a ten minute walk away from the main village through dense jungle, a route that was soon to become our commute. A large banab became our home, which, with real beds for the first time in three weeks, was absolute luxury. There is no commute in the world better than the one that we took to the health hut each morning. Through the trees, nothing but the sound of birds, far from the bustling roads of home. With the experience of previous villages under our belts, our setup was slicker, our skills more honed, our patter refined. Healthy eating lessons at the primary school and appearances at Sunday church services meant that we were soon widely known throughout the village. This resulted in a large influx of participants, taking us well over the 150 mark. With early starts each morning, now part of our routine, we would sit by the river and listen to the wonderfully unfamiliar dawn chorus, occasionally interrupted by the spluttering of an engine as captains tinkered with their boats, preparing for the long day ahead. Freddy, a Cayman resident to that stretch of water, could regularly be seen gliding ominously past, reminding us that a cooling dip was best avoided. One morning we were lucky enough to watch a pair of giant otters playing on the bank opposite us before slipping seamlessly into the water and disappearing. As our final day in the interior dawned, a guide took us downriver to where we hiked through the jungle to the top of one of the village's sacred mountains. The shadows of the dense canopy above gave little respite from the searing sun. Up steep slopes on all fours and past deserted jaguar dens, only stopping occasionally for drinks of water. Once at the top, however, we were richly rewarded. We stood looking out on the vast sea of uninterrupted jungle. The 9,000 miles to home felt so much further. This was a different, untouched world. Endings inevitably come too soon. What once seemed strange is now the norm. You no longer bat an eye at the sight of scorpions, caiman or monkeys swinging confidently by. But as you realise there is no more work to be done, no more data to be collected, thoughts of returning home no longer seem quite as bad. The golden age of exploration may have come to an end, but the age of research is still young. With every new innovation, new technology and new discovery, we move a step closer to knowing more about the people and places first brought to light by the geographic explorers who went before.